Hello and welcome, 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 welcome to his ministries, hearts, and submission, his ministry. I'm so delighted to have you once again to join in or follow on YouTube on our his ministry channel, catching the replay for the Acts of the Apostles Bible study series. This has been an amazing series and we are coming to an end. Um, we actually have two more lessons. So this lesson and one more, and it will conclude our teaching on the Acts. So if you haven't had opportunity, I really um, suggest that you go out to our His Ministry YouTube channel and you can actually see the playlist. And by there, you can literally go by the different um, lessons that we had and really kind of dive into it. Uh, even if you've already read Acts, it's really good. You'll get something out of it that I'm sure that you didn't have revelation for before. So before we get started, I am Sarah Houston, and I want to make sure that we open up in prayer before we get started and go any further. So go ahead, grab your journal, your notebook, get your Bible, get your water, be somewhere where you can be still and it can be quiet so that you can really take advantage and get into the Bible study tonight. All right, let's go ahead into prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we bless you, we glorify you, we give you honor, we give you thanksgiving, we give you praise, for you alone are worthy of it all, God. We thank you for your son's sacrifice. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to have your word, Father, that we could go to and look at our predecessors, that we can go to and look at the blueprint for our life. We thank you for the apostles' doctrine, God. We thank you for the acts of the apostles. We thank you for the act of the Holy Spirit, God. We thank you that even through Acts, that we see how the Holy Spirit was moving, God. We thank you, Father, that you had a plan to redeem your people before the foundation of the world. So, Lord, I ask that the ears will be open, even as they're listening to this live, and even as they go back and they're listening to this on the replay, Father, that you open the ears and let it not just be itchy ears or let them be distracted, God, but let them tune in and focus on those things that you want them to hear, to make it clear, to make it crystal clear for them, Lord. So God, I thank you for all that you're doing in this study, God. I ask that you cover and keep them and you perfect them right where they're at. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. I am going to come off camera and we're going to dive into this lesson tonight. All right. So as we are getting into this, let me just go ahead and turn my little background music off and just get some things situated here really quick. All right. Again, we are in Acts and we are going to be coming from the Acts chapter 27 and Acts chapter 28. So as we're getting started with this, um, tonight we're going to be talking about Paul's journey to Rome. Paul's journey to Rome. And if you notice, these last few chapters really have been um, following along with Paul's um, ministry mission trips, in addition to when he got arrested and now where he had plead, pleaded, pleaded to see um, Caesar at Rome to plead his case. And this is what we're going to talk about that journey. And if we know anything, we know that Paul's life after he was arrested by God on his experience, his experience on the Damascus Road, that it hadn't been all, you know, um, roses and butterflies. You know, he's had a very interesting, challenging, trying journey, but through his journey, he continued to press forward and persevere and to be able to continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter every incident, every twist and turn, which could have cost him his life, he continued to seize the opportunities to do God's will. And so that's what we're going to dive in tonight and looking at this journey. All right. So with that, the outline for tonight, we'll be talking about a little bit of 
the journey from Caesarea to Fairhaven, um, Paul's advice versus the majority's advice, right? So when Paul gave his advice to the centurion versus those that, you know, who were, I guess, the subject matter experts or the experts advice, uh, how they were stuck in the storm, um, about how he even spoke about God's promises and even how he encouraged them and what took place when he had that shipwreck at Malta and why was that so significant? And then last but not least, when he arrived in Rome. All right. So last week, um, evangelist Keisha, she went over about how Paul spoke to King, um, oh gosh, why am I going to say Agrippa? <laughs> How he, how, how he spoke to King Agrippa and he shared his testimony with him so much so that King Agrippa was like, you almost doing a good job with almost converting me to be a Christian. And Paul was like, I wish not only that you almost, but that everyone else would also hear the gospel and take part of that and convert. Right, so now, one thing that I thought was so significant, but it goes to show you that when God has a purpose and he has a, a plan and you have to follow his plan and stay in his will, King Agrippa has said, actually in verse 26, let me, I'm, I'm sorry, chapter 26, uh, let me get the exact scripture. Okay, yes. Okay, chapter 26, verse 32. And this is after Paul shared his testimony and shared with him that, you know, he wished that everyone would have also, you know, um, taken the opportunity to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then in verse 32, it says, Then said Agrippa unto Phetus, this man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. So it was his thoughts that had Paul not asked to be sent to Rome to go before Caesar, that based off of everything that he heard, that it was possible that when a sponsor got to him, that he would have been set free, right? Now we know how hard those Jews were um, protesting and plotting and everything to have Paul killed and not only arrested but actually to have him killed but King Agrippa was like had he not even petitioned to go to Rome and see Caesar he might have been set free now he was saying that from his perspective but we know that God had already given Paul that vision telling him to be of good cheer that he would go before Rome and speak about him and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so now we're gonna talk about how this journey all the way from where they're at in Caesarea to Rome, Italy, what this journey was like. Why is it significant that the Bible speaks to this and that the Lord outlines um, the various places that they went and what they experienced and he allowed Luke to be the writer who was actually scribing this to bring this information why was this so important why all right well let's get into this all right because we're going to go over there's going to be a whole lot of um, names and words that we may not really understand however you are more than like um able sorry you're more than able to look some of those things up so that you can also get a better understanding and just like when we're doing our bible study um, you're listening and you're watching me do this but you can always go into this a little bit more further you can look at the names you can look at the culture you can break it down even more that also helps you gain a better understanding and so what we're looking at before us is just an example of a, a Roman cargo ship, like a, a cargo ship of a, of a boat, this is what it would look like potentially that what Paul would have been on, okay? 
And even before I get on to the scripture, I'm just going to talk a little bit about this journey. Okay, so we know that when we get into chapter 27, which is talking about his journey, we're going to just look at this. Paul began his 2000 mile trip to Rome at Caesarea. Okay, did you hear what I said? 2000 mile trip to Rome. Now that doesn't sound too bad because you're saying, well, it's on a boat. How quickly could a boat go? Okay, this is not like your cruise ships now. Okay, this is not like what we have where they're automatic, they're mechanical, they have engines. A lot of this depend on the winds. All right, there was a lot of manual work that also took place. So to avoid the open seas, the ship followed the coastline. At Myra, Paul was put on a vessel bound for Italy. It arrived with difficulty at Sydney, then went to Crete, landed on the port of Fairhaven. Next stop was Phoenix. All right, so then now this is, goes on to talk about how the ship was blown south around. It drifted for two weeks until it was shipwrecked on the island of Malta. And then I want to just drop this down a little bit because I want us to have some context of when this could have been. So the journey to Rome began, they stated, early fall, about 60 AD, and it ended the following spring of 61 AD after a shipwreck near Malta. Now, early fall, we know that based off of the fast and the Passovers and the times of what this took place is why they're estimating that this took place in early fall. So early fall, we're talking about like October, right? So October, November, December, January, February, March, April. This trip was maybe in total six to seven months. All right. Now let's get into this. All right. So we are going to go in and we are going to start reading in chapter 27. I'm going to read the first seven verses. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So entering a ship of Adralomatum, <laughs> forgive me, because I can't pronounce these words correctly, so forgive me. We put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristotle a Macedonia of Thessalonia was with us. And the next day we landed at Sidon and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. When we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were, or were contrary. And when we had sailed over the seas, which is off of Sicilia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. When we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulty off of Cinerus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off Salmon. All right, you're like, okay, what does that mean? I just sound like a bunch of places. All right. Let's just look at this. So, you know, I love to have the map of what's always going on with Paul. And this is the map of Paul's journey to Rome that correlates with chapters 27 and 28. And over here with this big red arrow down on the bottom right, you see that this is where they're starting from. Okay. Caesarea. So this kind of puts it into um, context for you, but it also gives you a visual of seeing this, right? Because they're down here in Caesarea near Jerusalem. So they're in a whole another continent, right? And so Paul boards the ship with the centurion. Now I want to I want to note that when he actually began this long journey, okay, yes, he's entrusted to Julius the centurion, right? But he's also on there with other prisoners that is placed in the hands of Julius as well. And it was his job, Julius, to book the passage 
to deliver all the prisoners safely to Rome. Okay, so they got everyone that was going to be going to Rome at one time. And so with Paul, there was about 275 other people on board the ship headed north up the coast to Sidon. Okay. And that, that includes the prisoner, that includes, you know, those that um, had to man the ship, right? The staff, the workers, okay, the probably the other guards, um, you know, that was with Julius. So they actually had quite a bit of people on there. And so once they got on there, they started going up north, like I said, to Sidon, right? So we see where Sidon's at. All right, now they're going up along the coast. Going up along the coast, they didn't go out in the open sea. They didn't go straight across. Now you see, if they went straight across, it would have been a little bit different, but they decided to go up along the coast. All right, so now they get on over to Myra. Now, before we get to that one part, once they're at Myra, Oh, no, no, I want to go back because I'm looking at verse three, because when they were at Sidon and Julius treated Paul kindly, I want to go back to that because when you look at that, he treated Paul kindly and he allowed him to go see his friends and get supplies to, um, you know, be able to get whatever he needs. Now, remember, he is a prisoner, but he allowed Paul to go and do that. Now, why do you think he allowed that? I mean, I think part of that he allowed that because what? Could he possibly just trust it, Paul, knowing what type of person he was and what type of character he had? Or maybe he actually sent someone with Paul um, as he was getting those different supplies, right? And so next, Paul comes back. He gets on back on the boat. They sail on up to Myra. They changed to a grain ship sailing to Italy, okay? And so that's really what I was showing you earlier is something like this, okay, a cargo ship. And as you can see, it's not a cruise ship. It doesn't have a, a lot of places where, you know, there's a whole lot of covering because it's really um, meant to carry cargo. So they changed to a grain ship sailing to Italy at Myra, Lycia, okay? Then they go on to um, Sinus. They go down to Salmon. They go down to Crete, Fair Havens, all right? So now we're gonna pick up there because that's where we stopped at was verse eight when it said the passing, it was difficult. We came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lycia. Now, why, why was that difficult, right? Why was that so difficult? Hmm, I know you're like, this is not, this is not really interesting, but I really want you to kind of see this and listen to me why I'm going into these details because sometimes we just had this picture and vision in our mind and we we're like, well, what is God doing? And because we don't see the plan and we don't know how, what it's gonna take and the journey that it's gonna to take to get his ultimate outcome, we can sometimes dismiss things or think that we know what's best. So Paul had no idea what this journey was gonna be like. God didn't tell him what this journey was gonna be like ahead of time but he told him to be of good cheer, that no harm would come near him and that he had to go to Rome. And see, with this, traveling with 275 people up the coast in the fall was already gonna be challenging. And I kind of like giving this history um, so that it helps, again, put some of this stuff into um, context for you so that you begin to really understand why this journey was significant, okay? Now, once they arrived at Myra, okay, that's on the southernmost tip of Asia, okay, they found that Alexander's ship, okay, a grain ship, probably maybe from Egypt, 
sailing to Italy and they got aboard that. Now, however, those winds that they were facing did not improve. They were extremely rough winds. And remember, this wasn't a motor power powered ship, okay? They really depend on the winds. And these winds were extremely strong. And they forced, and they were forced to sail on the lee side of Crete because of the winds bringing them into a small harbor on the island of Crete called the Fair Havens. And you see where the Fair Havens are on this map, okay? So they had to come around this little island to the Fair Havens, okay? And the ship got caught in the storms 14 days. 14 days. Now, when I say 14 days, let me just go down a little bit more so that you can get a better understanding. Not only were they sailing this route, but, and that it was very dangerous. You remember earlier, I mentioned that it probably was like around early October, okay? Because any sailing that they did after September was considered dangerous. All the shipping that they did stopped in the middle of what we would consider November until the middle of March, because it was considered too dangerous, okay? Because of the weather. But Rome, a lot of time, encouraged their ships to come in as late as they could and as early in the season as they could because they needed the grain, right? So we think about that today, how we're always waiting for the ships to come in with the import of the items and the product and the food that we need, right? And they're coming all throughout the different times of the year. Now, you imagine because they're coming with this cargo, if they're facing different types of weather, that could really delay. But we have um, probably even now certain times when, you know, there's, um, I'm, you know, I'm not a logistics person, but I'm sure there's times where they yield to the weather based off of it and it can cause things to be delayed. And sometimes people feel like they can still push through that. Well, Rome was encouraging that, that if they could go ahead and make the dangerous trip that they will actually make it worth their while. And I'm sure that they felt like they really needed the grain that they probably paid a huge premium for the grain at that time. So they probably made it worth their while for you know, the ship captain and the ships to even consider picking up the cargo, in this case, the wheat to get there, okay? So, they probably also ensure that their ships, you know, will be taken care of if they had any loss or they had any damage. You know, we're assuming this because this was a dangerous time to actually sail. But Rome wanted its cargo. They also had prisoners. And we know that God wanted Paul to get to Rome. Now, while they're at Fairhaven, now let me go ahead. Let me go to next because I was getting ready to talk about why they're at Fairhaven, but let me go on to the next few verses. Verse nine. Now, when much time has been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over. Now, let's talk about that because the fast was already over. Why did the Bible feel the need to speak of the fast being over? Okay, because see, the day of atonement, the Jewish day of atonement fell in the latter part of September or in October. So usually the sailing season by Jewish calculation lasted from Pentecost, which would be like May to June to the tabernacles, which was five days after the fast. So the Romans considered sailing after September 15 doubtful and check this out after November 11th, suicidal. So that's how dangerous it was for them to be out there, okay? Make a note, dangerous seas, dangerous times, dangerous, um, um, so many opportunities with 
you know, major storms to come through. Now, while they're at Fairhaven, Paul has a vision, right? So let's continue on with verse 13. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. Not long after a tempest headwind arose called Euroclidon, I think. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. Okay, so that basically is saying that when they couldn't turn the ship into the wind, they gave up and they let it run before the gale. They just let it do its thing. And running under the shelter of an island called Claudia, we secured the skiff with difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, fearing lest they should run aground on the cypress sands that struck sail and so were driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. Okay, so what they're saying, even with that verse, is that on um, verse 18, and because we were exceedingly tempest tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. They began to throw the cargo overboard because they felt like the ship was too weighted in that, in that storm. 19, on the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. See, they started throwing their, their gear. They started looking for things to lighten up. They threw their gear. They threw some of the cargo over. Verse 20, now when neither sun nor st stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. So with that storm raging for so many days and then not seeing the sun and then not seeing the stars, they began to lose all hope. And we see this on the map here, right? This is where they're at, where they're talking about how they were caught in that storm for 14 days, okay? And that they were losing all hope. And verse 21 says, but after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, men, you should have listened to me and have not sail from Crete and incur this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no lost life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve. Listen to that. He said, he said this very authoritative. And now I urge you to take heart. He's telling them, take, be of courage, take courage that none of you will lose your life. Even though this ship will go down, you will not lose your life. And he's telling them because the angel of God to whom I belong and whom, to, whom I serve stood beside me saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So he's saying, what's more, God and his God and his goodness has granted safety to not just you, but to everybody sailing with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe that God, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. So he's saying we must be shipwrecked on an island. He's sharing with them. He's sharing this word with them. He's trying to encourage them. And so you can only imagine that when they begin to hear the sounds of the waves breaking on the land and, you know, they're going to and fro and they really couldn't see and they really were uncertain and this was uncharted. You can imagine that they were very fearful and thought they were going to die. And not knowing, and here comes Paul saying, okay, be of good courage, right? Be of good courage. And it's amazing because <laughs> I only can imagine being in that situation and not knowing what to do. So you got Paul on there and Paul is hanging on to the word of the Lord and knowing what God not only told him in the vision that night, 
but also before that, when he was in the jail cell, telling him that he was to go to Rome. And so even when we looked at verse 9 through, I'm sorry, verse 9 through 12, when Paul was giving the advice to the centurion, he was telling him, look, do not sail any farther. Because he had already perceived that their journey was going to be in danger and it would endanger their lives and their ship. But, you know, the centurion didn't listen. He listened to the helmsman, the, you know, basically like the captain, the owner of the ship, despite Paul's warning, because he probably chose to listen to him, maybe because he felt like Paul was more of the expert. But also, look at this, it was also inconvenient in, in the winter at Fairhaven. And the majority of those people that were on the ship were against staying there. So they knew that in Fairhaven, that it was winter, it was cold, it was a storm. Remember, this is not a cruise ship. So they didn't have the proper attire. They weren't, they didn't have the proper shelter, right? So the centurion decision turned out to be a mistake because he was like, no, we're gonna keep going. We're gonna, we're gonna keep going. So when we look at that, um, he based his decision on his, on the helmsman, the owner of the ship's expert opinion. He also based it off of the majority of the passengers, the prisoners and those others that they did not wanna stay there. So he based it on the majority. And then, you know, also probably on his own personal convenience. And we know that when you do decisions based off of expert opinion, majority rule, or personal convenience, it's not always right. Because one, we got to always seek God's guidance and not base our decisions solely on, solely on the common standards of this world. We can use wisdom. Um, we can use our intellect, we can know what we believe to be true, but that should not always be the 100% reason why we go with these decisions, whether it's the majority, whether it's the expert, whether it's our personal, but we should seek God in everything that we do because our ways are not his ways, our thoughts are not his thoughts. He orders our steps. We gotta put our plans before him. When we do this and we do it more often and we go to God, God, I'm bringing this before you because we want to make sure that not only are we presenting it before God, but we want to be in his will, most importantly. Yeah, that's what the subject matter expert is saying. Yeah, that's what the group is saying. Remember, I told, I always talk about group thinking, right? Sometimes we have a tendency just to go with group thinking without doing the research, but ultimately all that could be sounding so good but God is like no that's not what I want you to do and so we have to be very in tune to his voice even when everything lines up and it may look like it's a go it look like it's a yes but God could say no that's not what I want don't go don't do it stop so we got to be mindful that we still have to take it before God. God has the first and the final say because we seek to be blessed and to be in his will, right? Let's think about that. Have you ever felt helpless like in a storm like the ship was where you're going to and fro, you're tossed, you don't know night from day, you know, you, you're doing everything that you know humanly possibly to do, but it's still not working. You know, have you ever been in a situation like that? I know I have. And then sometimes if you're really honest, you find out that you really didn't seek God. And if you did seek God, you didn't wait. And you're like, well, I waited and I didn't hear anything. But you proceeded. And dealt with the consequence later and realized that God wasn't in that decision. You know, that's, I think that's something that we all have experienced when we've dealt with different crises in our lives where we tried everything. We tried everything. 
We tried everything based off of what we knew to do, what people were advising us, with family members, friends, community experts, groups, whatever, our personal feelings was trying to have us do. But we didn't take it back to the Lord. Maybe the crisis was a result of a decision that we made that we are experienced the consequence because of disobedience. You know, um, Paul gave such confidence, you know, when I just read through verse 21 to 26, he gave such confidence when everyone else was like in total disrespect total despair so you ever been with people and they're like freaking out and they're just like oh what are we gonna do oh i can't take it oh here we go again oh not again oh you know they always are like fretting worrying doubting they always feel like like remember like chicken little the sky is falling everything is too much that's all they see is a doom and gloom but paul he was steadfast on what god said and god sent an angel to give him a vision to encourage him and the promise of God to Paul through the angel assured him that him and everyone that was on there would be protected so Paul in spite of what he saw in spite of what he was feeling as a result of being on this boat that was about to be shipwrecked he trusted God he was unwavering Let's stop right there. He was unwavering. He trusted God. Now remember, they're on this boat. They're in a storm. It's not great conditions. They can't see sun. They can't see stars. They're taking hits left and right. Everyone's scared. There's an uproar, not knowing what's going to happen. They're living this experience. But yet, he unwavered on God's promise to him. That's a whole word right there. We can stop right there. That when we're going through our storm and we have a word from the Lord, we have his promise. In spite of what it feels like, in spite of what we see, can we stand on his promise unwavering and ride the storm out and ride it out and as we're riding it out to be able to encourage those who have been put in our stewardship or that are around us that's powerful that is so powerful and you know when we think about all the wonderful promises in the scripture, including peace in him in the midst of our affliction. We have so many scriptures that we can refer to, like John 16, 33, answer to our prayers, and Mark 11, 24, John 16 and 24, his continual providence, Matthew 6, 33, Hebrews 13 and 5, Romans 8, 28 and 5. Verse 32, he strengthens, he keeps us. Like 1 Peter 5 and 10, he's the crown of life. The hope of resurrection. By us trusting fully in God's promises with our faith, we can have confidence in him as we go through adversity, as we go through storms, as we deal with the ups and downs of life. Because we know that God is faithful to his promises and he will not forsake us. He will not forsake us. That's why it's so important for us to get in his word so that we can absorb his word, that we can inhale his word, that we can breathe his word, that we can be filled with his word, refueled with his word, hydrated with his word, and know that God is faithful even in the midst of the storm. His promises are yes and amen, that he never goes back on his word. But a lot of times the enemy will try to get us distracted 
and focus on what's going on in front of us instead of what God said to us, what God's promise was for us. The enemy will get us, oh, you're out here on a you're out here on the storm. You got all this happening. Look at this, this hardship happening in your life. Look what's going on. Yeah, this, these trials, these storms are real. We're not negating that. We're not minimizing that. But even through your storm, even through your tests, even through your trials, God is still God. He still sits on the throne. Did he not give you his word? Do you not have the Holy Spirit in you to bring you peace in the midst of the storm? Hmm. Wow, it's amazing because Paul, he didn't keep what God spoke to him, to himself, but he shared it with everyone else to lift them up, to encourage them right, to give them hope. And see, sometimes we can go through our storms and our trials through life. And even as God is refueling us and refreshing us and renewing us, sometimes even as we're going through that, because we feel like, oh, we're just now coming where we can breathe. We don't realize that we too still need to be able to lift others up to still share the gospel, to even motivate and encourage others, even as we're facing adversity or the hardest time of our life. Sometimes that's when we get pressed the most, when we feel like we have nothing else to give, but yet God refills us so that we can continue to pour out because he wants his will and purpose to be done. And he reminds us of that yes, that yes to his way, that yes to his will, that yes, God, I will do your will, especially for those that are called to the fivefold. He reminds us that our service to him is public service and that we have to be ready to move upon his word, upon his command. And so when we think about how we really do have a commission from the Lord to share the gospel with everyone around us. And if we had that love and that obedience and that perseverance that Paul had, we want to reach others regardless of our circumstances, meaning that we can look at our circumstances and still find hope, that we can still find light, that we can still see how we can share God share Jesus, share the gospel. And that's what Paul did in every situation that he encountered. He saw a way to be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some believe, some didn't believe, but he still shared. So when we look at that, when we know that we've been blessed with God's guidance and his insurance, we can share that with others. they they would be blessed to see the strength, to see the peace, to see how we're enduring a storm. Yeah, it's not easy, but do you know that people are always watching? And even as we are trying to keep our heads above water and receive that oxygen to keep moving, that even that is still a blessing to others, so besides having that strength and that peace and that joy from God in our own adversity can serve as the best living testimony to others, we don't often think about that because we'll be going through that situation ourselves, but our lives and how we live it, and sometimes we have to live it out loud, is one of our best living testimonies when others can see our calm and confidence in mm, our mighty, our mighty, mighty, mighty God, they will be attracted to him. They will wanna know more about this God that we serve. Now, when you even look at those words, when, when um, it said God had granted you all those who sail with you, 
See, what Paul did throughout that journey is that we saw that he was so obedient to God and that he was concerned and cared about his fellow passengers that he wanted them to turn to God. He saw them as souls. He loved them the way God loved them and he saw them as souls, not just other criminals, not just as strangers, not just as workers, but he saw them and wanted them to turn to God. He had a desire for them to know God. So God honored that. And God in his awesome way, because he knows everything about us because he created us before the foundation of the world. He allowed their lives to be preserved so that everyone on board had the opportunity to hear Paul share about Jesus Christ. And because of Paul and his perseverance in ministry, the, the people came to know the God that Paul served. Now remember, earlier, they didn't listen to the advice. They didn't want to stay at the fair haven because of the storm in the winter right and then once they had this shipwreck and he shares with them to give them hope and courage they believe and now they're even taking more interest in hearing about this god that paul serves hmm god could do god does things like that today I mean, I'm sure we can sit here and think about some examples, but, you know, God grants us people that we meet in our lives so that are drawn just for us, drawn to us, for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and serve them for Christ's sake. You ever hear about how um, people will talk about, I know those that are called to me, right? Everyone has people that are called specifically to them. And so a lot of times, it's not just to make new friends, you know, or to find people who we can just um, connect with and, you know, set up networking or, you know, projects. But God calls people specifically to us, whether we like them or we don't like them. They're pleasant or they're unpleasant, but he'll send people to us who were to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with, that they're to see our lives as living testimonies. And I love how Paul described God because he called God the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. Now, isn't that something? He said, let me tell you, I'm not ashamed. I want you to know the God to whom I belong. I belong to the almighty God. And he's the one that I serve. He proclaimed that and let them know boldly about that. So what does that say about our relationship with God and how we live our lives? Because we're reading about how Paul spoke so boldly how he persevered, how he used wisdom, how he used his intellect, how he used his knowledge, right? His experiences, but most importantly, how he followed the Holy Spirit, how he was submitted, how he was sold out, how he was steadfast, how he was assured of what he was called to do. What does it say about our relationship with God and how we live our lives? Because he leveraged every situation that he was in to be able to speak about Jesus Christ. He knew when to speak and when not to speak. He assessed the crowds, his audience, in his situations. Right? What does that say about us? We want, we belong to God. We are his treasure possessions in whom have been purchased with his blood, with his son, Jesus' blood. That was an expensive price, right? So 
because we belong to God, we're his, those that he had called before the foundation of the world, God's elect, we are under his special protection. You want some scripture references? Deuteronomy 32, 9 through 10, Romans 8, 31 through 39, 1 John 5, 18 to 19. See, when we live as a people of God, because remember, we need to be like Paul. To the God, the God whom I belong to. See, I belong to the almighty God. Jesus' blood set me free, redeemed me. It should be no, there's, there's no confusion on who I belong to. So you got to be sure, make your election sure. What God do you belong? If you're going to serve Baal, serve Baal. But if you're going to serve the most almighty, high, sovereign God, then that's who you serve. But it should be clear on who you serve. It should not be no faltering, no wavering. Paul was very clear. We need to be clear on who we belong to. Nowadays, you get too many people trying to belong to hybrid gods, multiple deities. They say they serve and love Jesus, but they, they're, they're taking in other deities as well. No, we can't be double-minded when it comes to this thing. Who do you belong to? I belong to the almighty God. Hmm. So when we live as people of God and dedicate ourselves to carry out his will, that's what we're, that's what we're called to do. We don't have a will. If you want to keep your will, then don't, then don't give your life. Don't, don't accept the redemption. Don't accept Jesus. Don't repent. Do you, do you keep your will. But if you're not going to fall in line with his requirements and stipulations, not just because of that, but because you have a new heart or you want a new heart and you love God and you know that you're, you're called before the foundation of the world. You want to serve him. You want to please him. You know that your life is no longer yours. You know that you were brought with a price that you are redeemed. And then secondly, we serve God. God is our Lord and he's our master because we belong to him. We belong to him. We don't belong to ourselves. We're here on this earth. Yeah, we're carrying out our purpose on this earth. But we belong to him. He's our master. Sin is not our master. God is our master. And we need to understand his purpose for us in our lives and make it the reason why we live. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15 and Acts 20 to 24. I hope you write any scriptures down because I'm not reading them, but I want you to go and read them. Don't just take my word for them. Stop the re, stop it and replay it and get the scriptures. And then also when we, because we are his servants, we owe everything to God, everything. And we do not deserve anything from God in return. If we don't get anything from God, he's done more than enough. We are breathing. We're on this earth. He's given us an opportunity to come out of the darkness into the marvelous light. God, <laughs> he don't owe us anything. He don't owe us anything. We owe him everything for allowing us to be his redeemed. So when you think about that, our service to God is not only our duty, but we automatically should be like, yes, we're going to do your work. We're going to do it humbly. We're going to do it thankfully. We're going to do it obediently. 
We're going to look to you who's the author and the finisher of our faith. We're going to get in your word. We're going to subject ourselves. We're going to continue to do the soul work each and every, each and every day. We're going to remember whose we are, who we belong to. We're going to be all in. All in for you, Lord. All in. Right? All right. So let me just go on because I, I see our time is ticking here. All right. So now we're going on to verse 27. Now, when the 14th night had come, and as we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were drawing near to land, and they took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms, and when they had gone a little farther, they took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms. So right there, let me just say what that is. They dropped a weighted line, and they found that the water was 120 feet deep. But a little later, they did it again, and they found it to be 90 feet deep. So they knew they were getting close to land based off of what they dropped, and they could tell how close they were, okay? The farther out they were, you know, the longer the drops were. But they can tell as they were getting closer. And so at that, um, 29 says, then fearing lest we should run aground on the rock, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. All right. So they knew that they were getting close to land. They they were worried that they were going to, you know, thrust upon those rocks and crash. So then verse 30, as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, when they had let down the skiff into the sea under the pretense of putting out anchors from the prow. Now, what that means is that the sailors tried to abandon the ship. And as they lowered the lifeboats that they thought they were going to um, escape on, they put out anchors in front of the ship. Verse 31, Paul said to the centurion, that's Julius, and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. So he's telling them, look, you all will die unless these sailors stay aboard. He's like, that ain't what God said. God said, Everyone that's with you, I'll keep. And he said, now they will die. Everyone, everyone will die unless these sailors stay aboard. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall. So they cut away the ropes from the lifeboat and let it drift away. So as the day was about to dawn, verse 33, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, today is the 14th day. You have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. So he's saying, look, everyone, you all need to eat. You've been so worried that you haven't touched food for two weeks. Because think about it. They're at the dangerous time of the year. They're dealing with all these challenges with the weather. So much so they didn't know what's going on, especially those 14 days of night not seeing the sun, not seeing the stars, with the winds tossing them back and forth, really um, crashing up against the waves that they didn't have time to eat. They so doggone scared. And then they're out there in the environment and they're not really protected, right? It's not like they're, again, they're not on a cruise ship in a cabin, but they hadn't had to eat. So he's like, look, you all been so worried. You need to take a moment and eat, eat. And he said, come on, you need to, I urge you to take nourishment for this is for your survival since not a hair will fall from your head, from the head of any of you. So he's telling them, eat something now for your own good. Not one hair is going to come off your head. You will not perish. And 35, and when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. See, he gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. He didn't try to say his little grace underneath his breath. He didn't go to a corner and try to say grace. He said it before them, because remember he said, the God to whom I belong and whom I serve on verse 23. So he's saying, look, I've already, I'm giving you hope. You all need to eat. You're worrying to death. You're trying to escape. 
he's saying eat and then he's telling them i'm giving thanks to the one whom i belong and who i serve i'm putting him first in all things okay then they were all encouraged and also took the food themselves to eat and in all were 276 persons on the ship. Remember, I, was, I said that earlier. There was about, I think I said 275. So correct it, it's 276 persons on the ship. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened up the ship and they threw out the wheat into the sea. Now, remember before they were throwing out cargo, they were throwing out equipment, but they wanted to lighten the ship up even more. So they began throwing some of the wheat overboard. Now remember this wheat was to go to Rome. So Rome is waiting for this, this ship to come in, but they're like, look, if we're gonna make it, we gotta do something with this. We gotta lighten the ship up even more. And now that they were able to stop and eat and be encouraged that they weren't gonna die, it helped them, okay? Now here we're getting to the shipwreck on Malta. We're going into verse 39. When it was a day, they did not recognize the land. When it was day, sorry, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach onto which they had planned to run the ship if possible. And when they let go the anchors and left them in the sea, meanwhile, losing the rudder's ropes as they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for shore. But striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground and the prow struck fast and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the balance of the waves. Okay, so they, they hit a shoal and ran the ship up on the ground too soon. Okay, so it's almost like, you know, you running a car up on a, on a curb or you, 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 you're you getting there too fast, too quickly. Okay, and so the stern was smashed by the force of the waves and it began to break apart. So this is what they needed to help steer the ship, you know, the mechanics of the ship. And 42, as the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoner, lest any of them should swim away and escape. Now they're thinking, okay, we're still on duty. Now the ship then hit up on this shore too quickly. These, these prisoners can run away. If they run away, we got to kill them. But the centurion wanting to save Paul kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped to the land safely. Now, why do you think that the centurion listened to Paul's warning this time when we just read from verses 12, 27 to 32, right? We don't know if, you know, the centurion listened to Paul this time because Paul's advice made sense to him or because he had gained a deeper respect for Paul because he saw how he carried himself and, you know, he could feel the presence of God on him. But one thing that we know is clear that everyone by this time and the time that they'd been together knew that Paul was something different, that he was a man that really carried weight and power in his words. And they had gained a deeper respect for Paul. Um, they knew that his words were trustworthy. They, they knew that he wasn't saying things just to try to trick him, but he was a man that upheld character. Um, for they were met with disaster because they did not heed Paul's warning the first time, even though it didn't common sense was like oh we're not prepared for this winter oh we shouldn't be here but he was trying to forewarn them ahead of time to just stay here but they were like no so had they listened to him the first time some of that could have been avoided but they dealt with the consequences of not listening but they had to learn right so now they could see that God was within Paul and it gave him courage and so even Paul's faith in his evidence, I'm sorry, Paul's faith was evident in his words and his actions because one, he was confident that God would not fail to keep his promise. And that's why he assured him that not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. 
and he encouraged them to eat something. He was confident that God would not fail to keep his promise again. And then two, he said his faith was also evident in his thanksgiving to God. Remember, he thanked God in verse 35, giving thanks to God in the middle of a storm is not easy. But Paul knew that God always had a good purpose, even in the times of trouble. He was able to show his gratitude to God. Mm, I like to go stop right there. Go back. Giving thanks to God in the middle of a storm. My God. My God. Can we look back on the last storm that we went through? Were we able to give God thanks even in the middle of that storm, even in that middle of darkness, even in that time of uncertainty, were we still able to reach down in our spirit, in our soul, and give God thanks, a sincere thanksgiving? Mm. Stay there for a moment. Just stay there for a moment. Because that's, that's saying a whole lot. Because a lot of times when we're in our storm, we don't want to give thanks. We're so caught up in what's happening that we can feel like we're so underwater that we don't know what's coming next, that it's more than we can bear. But there's something about giving God thanks in the midst of that storm, holding on to his word. I often, a lot of times when I'm going through different things, certain scriptures I hold on to and I cling to that word. And even sometimes, even though you're going through something that could be so heart-wrenching or so painful, you know, or just so mind-blowing um, or emotionally, um, you know, draining, that even to be able to not only give thanks, but to pull way down there and even find your praise and put on the garment of praise during some of the hardest times in your life, during some of the darkest times, that when we're able to pull out that garment of praise, how it begins to shift our storm, how it begins to shift what's going on within us, our own internal storm. And it begins to push the darkness back and allow the light. You know, Paul's faith helped those that were traveling with them because they saw Paul's faith and they heard his words of encouragement and they saw how he carried himself. And they can tell that he was not someone just simply saying that. You know how when people just say things and you're like, they don't really mean it. They're not really sincere. No, they, they knew. And that's why they were like, you're right. And they felt consolation in that. And they were able to calm themselves to eat. And so that they can have their strength. So even when we are walking out every day, trying to keep the faith, strengthen our faith, gain faith, we know that our faith in God can help others because when we truly believe that God watches over us, even in our afflictions, even in our storms, our dark times, our actions will show it. We won't fear. We'll remain calm. We won't be in despair, but we'll be hopeful. We will not be depressed, but we'll be thankful because our faith in God make us a source of encouragement and stability to those around us because it's never just about us. And the enemy always likes us to keep everything about us. It's not just about us. It's more than just us. Our life is more than just for us and our family and those that are close to us. But our lives should be a living testimony of the God that we serve. So even as we're going through this and how we go through this, it makes all the difference for those that are wavering, those that haven't even decided, but they're looking. Your life should be a living testimony to the things of God. Now, listen, I didn't say perfect. 
right? It's, we don't, we, we, we're not trying to show perfection. With that, we can't do because we only had one that was perfect. But our, our real lives should speak to the God that we serve and that he's faithful and that he's good. You know, you can see God's protection throughout the whole time on this journey. Even with this last few verses that we read, God protected Paul from the harm through the centurion, right? They listened to him and he made sure that no one was killed and that the soldier didn't harm him. Everybody made it safe to the shore, just as God had promised no one died, right? All right, so we're getting to the end here. Um, chapter 28, verse one. Now when they had escaped, they then found out that the island was called Malta. So where they actually had the shipwreck, and you can see right here on the map where Malta is. And think about this. This is a long trip. Remember I said it was over 2,000 miles, and it was about almost like six or seven months, okay? And they're on this little island called Malta, okay? And where they were all able to swim to the little beach part of Malta. And the natives showed us unusual kindness for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper, a poisonous snake came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. So basically that snake came out and bit him on his hand. So when the natives saw that the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow him to live. But he took off the creature in the fire and suffered no harm. So he shook, he shook him off. He shook that snake off like he would shake something crawling on you. He shook him off into the fire and he was unharmed in verse six however they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead but after they had looked for a long time and saw no harm come to him they changed their mind and said that he was a god now they're looking like you didn't die okay you just got bit by a poisonous snake and it must usually didn't take that long for you to start seeing the effects of the bite of that type of snake and they're like okay this ain't normal. So you're some type of God. In that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island. Okay. Now, what is a leading citizen? Okay. Because what does that what does that mean? That's like could be considered like a governor, a governor of that little area. Okay. So in that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island whose name was Publius who received us and entertained us, hmm, isn't that something? Entertained us courteously for three days. So he welcomed them, treated them kindly for three days. Now think about it, that's probably all of them. He didn't just say Paul, so that's all of them. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed. And he laid his hands on him and he healed him. Now see, look how God is moving. Even while he's there, they treated him kindly, make sure that they were taken care of. And he, he knew that the man was sick and he went in there and he healed him. See how God is still moving in miracles, signs and wonders. We're seeing this. And it happened, I'm sorry, verse nine. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. So once he healed the father, they all hearing about this, they're all coming. Now, can you imagine everyone who was on the boat with him, the prisoners, the soldiers, um, the centurion Julius, right? And you know, Luke is with him because he's writing all this down. He's capturing all this. And now he healed the father and now everyone else is coming and they're being healed. 
Look how God does things. He got them there safely, specifically had them shipwrecked at Malta. He's performing miracle signs and wonders. He's healing them. They also honored us in many ways. And when we departed, they provided such things as was necessary. So they really showed them honor. They gave them supplies, everything they would need for the next part of their trip because they still had a ways to go to get to Rome. And so after three months, y'all hearing this? After three months, look at Malta on the screen. After three months, we sailed in an Alexandria ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers, which had winter at the island. Okay, so there was another uh, ship by these twin brothers who had already taken um, their time to kind of stay at Malta because of the weather. And they were waiting for the weather to get better. So you know how like when people doctor their boats, that's basically what these twin brothers were doing at the island. Okay. And landing at Syracuse, we stayed three days. From there, we circled around, reached Regalum. And after one day, the south wind blew. And the next day, we came to Petulio, where we found brethren and were invited to stay with them seven days. And so we went towards Rome. Wow, you notice how, you know, they're going to these different places. So they got Syracuse, um, they stayed there three days. So remember th after three months, three days, and they went to Rego and they stayed there after one day and then the south wind blew. And then the next day, it took them all the way down here to Petulio, right? Because remember, they needed the wind. So the south wind blew. So it got them all the way down here, right? And then they met other believers, other brethren, and they spent a week with them, right? So isn't that something you get to a place and you find other believers and you can just connect? So now remember, this is not just Paul. This is all of these people, right? <laughs> this is whole group. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as AP Forum and three ends. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Okay. So right here, they came here and they met him. Paul's like, Lord, I thank you. You know that was something that God sent him there to be greeted by his elect to give Paul encouragement that we saw you, you're here, you made it, you know. Now, how did they know, right? You think about, there was no telephone, there was no internet, there was no, how did they know? How did they know who Paul was? How did they, you know what I'm saying? So you know how the, his steps were being ordered by God and how God was having people specifically and strategically in places because of his servant. And because of his servant, the others were being blessed in the process. And verse 16, now when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Now, that was a long trip, you all. That was like almost seven months. And you think about that, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but he said, it says that Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with, with a soldier who guarded him. So he didn't even have to be put with the other prisoners. He was trusted enough to be able to dwell separately and just have one guard because he knew Paul wasn't a flight risk. He knew Paul wasn't trying to cause any trouble. And he had spent all that time with Paul and he probably observed Paul. He come to see, he saw the miracle signs and wonders, right? Isn't that something? I mean, when you think about that, there's so much into this. And that's why I said, you know, when you're hearing me start out with this initial teaching and talking about these different parts, there's a lot of nuggets in here. There's a lot to pull out of just how strategic this journey to Rome was and what God was doing. And when you can look at it on a map and you can see the course of the journey, right? 
I mean, it's amazing. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, it's just, and it, it's such a long journey, the tenacity of the journey. I mean, it's something, I mean, whew. all right, let me, let me calm down because there's just a whole lot going through my head and what's popping up in my spirit right now. So it's amazing that Paul got that kind um, reception that he did when he actually got to Malta. I mean, that was amazing that they saw that that snake bite did not do his job and they thought he was some type of God, but he showed them who, who he belonged to and who he served and he was able to do those miracle signs and wonders. And then they honored him in so many ways because look, probably even everything that they um, believed in there on Malta, you know, they didn't see people get healed like that. I can imagine that it doesn't say it, but I can only imagine that, you know, those, he was able to um, share the gospel with them. I'm assuming the Bible doesn't say that, but, you know, with him performing those healings, I'm sure Paul would have mentioned something, I'm assuming. Um, but God did work through Paul. He did work through him while he was there. And then, you know, we just think about lastly, when he finally got to the iPod forum and the three ends, he was just so happy and he thanked God and took courage because they came all the way to see him as soon as they heard of his arrival. Who told him that he was there? Like who was there and went back and told everybody? That's what I'm wanting to know. They came and and met him hearing of his arrival, but how do they know he was on that boat? He wasn't on the same ship, you know, he was on multiple ships, but they came. So God got that word out to them. And so it was very encouraging for Paul to see those that were faithful uh, and, you know, those that were believing um, that were there on his arrival into Italy. And so, I can see that he just gave God thanks and probably gave him glory and that God was working in these believers to bear such spiritual fruit because of the way that they came. Because you know, you can go places and you think that you're coming to people who call themselves Christians or believers and the reception can be so cold, they can be so hateful, they can be so mean, they can be so cunning and they do not look like or operate or have the fruits of the spirit at all. Now, once they got to Rome, it was interesting because other prisoners were delivered to the captain, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself. And again, you know, that's not by accident or chance. God was good. He was setting him up for what was to come next. And as you see up here, um, that evangelist Keisha will go into more in depth next week is that Paul preaches the gospel for two years under house arrest as he awaits for his appeal to Caesar. She'll get into the rest of that. And that's going to be amazing because we, again, look at the timeline, look at the, look at the journey, look at everything that was done to finally get to Rome and what God has for Paul to do while he's there. So we are going to close with this because this has been an enjoyable lesson. I know it's been a little bit longer, but I thank you for hanging in there with me. And I thank you for capturing your scriptures so that you can go back and literally read those scriptures. But as we come to the end, we are going to make sure that we give the opportunity for those that may be listening on the replay to be able to give their life to Christ. And you have possibly already been contemplating it. You've been going back and forth. You've been really feeling a strong pull. You're feeling, you know, a certain way about certain things that you've done in your life and you feel sorry for it and you want to repent. Well, you can. And that's kind of the first thing is to be able to repent. 
and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he's died for our sins and that he was raised for three days. Scripture says in Romans 10 and 11, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we proclaim. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him, raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believeth on him would not be put to shame. So remember, I talk about how you were in God before the foundation of the world. None can come unless he draws them. And so you have the opportunity to come out of darkness into the marvelous light. Yeah, say this with me or read it off the screen. But most importantly, know that you are looking to have a repentant heart because you want God to give you a new heart. We're not just saying this because this is something to say, to do, and it's something that you hear people say, no, you're saying this from a sincere place because you're ready to make a change. You're really ready to get a new heart. And this is just the beginning. So come on, say it with me. Father, in the name of Yeshua Jesus, I come before you, your throne of grace, in a stance of surrender with a repentant heart. I confess my sins. And I ask earnestly that you will forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. By confessing my sins and forgiveness and asking for forgiveness clears all legal ground that the enemy has against me. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I believe that you died on the cross. And on the third day, you were raised from the dead. I believe that you transcended into heaven and now sitting at the right hand of Elohim God make an intercession for me. I believe that your blood paid for my sins, giving me the free gift of salvation and eternal life. I accept the free gift of salvation and eternal life. Thank you for granting me full access to the kingdom of God. Now I am seated in heavenly places with you, Jesus, with you, God, for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen and amen. And if you have rededicated your life or you just said that prayer with us and we are in the beginning of this journey as you are walking it out to not just say that I'm saved, but to be fortified in your salvation. Pray this with me. I pray by the power of your blood, Jesus, in faith, which commands and evicts every unclean spirit that has held my soul, my mind, my will, my emotions, my body, and my life captive to leave me now and go to the foot of the cross, Jesus, to do with them what you will. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to come in my heart and take up residency with me. Fill every vacant place in my soul, mind, will, and emotion, my heart, my body, and life with your love, your light, your truth, your divine presence and revelation. Holy Trinity, thank you for fortifying or re-fortifying my spirit and my soul. Thank you, Jesus, for the benefits of salvation, healing, and deliverance imputed to me because of what you did on the cross of Calvary. I receive and will maintain my freedom by living a submitted, committed, and obedient, dedicated life to you. I will live a life of repentance, love, and forgiveness. I will commune with you consistently. Holy Trinity, I will pray, praise, worship, and study your holy scriptures. I will live my life from henceforth devoted to advancing your kingdom for the rest of my life. Amen and amen. And if you said that, again, I pray that you have said that from a sincere place. And if you need resources, you need prayer, please go, um, you know, welcome to reach out to Evangelist Keisha or myself personally, if you know us, or you can reach us at hisministryonly at gmail.com. Again, that's hisministryonly at gmail.com. We will be happy to be able to provide you with some resources or some prayer as you are beginning to walk this out and you need to have your foundation. We want you to grow, to be successful, to be prepared for eternal life. 
So as we come to a close, I ask that you join us next Tuesday as we wrap up with Lesson 36, which will be brought to you by Evangelist Keisha for Paul's ministry at Rome, wrapping up the last part of Acts 28. It has been an amazing journey in Acts, and I pray that you have been blessed. I know we've been blessed. Now, we will be starting a new series coming up in September, and it will be all about Romans. Yes, we are hitting Romans next, because that's perfect, right? Paul, we're ending with Paul's ministry at Rome. So what's next is Romans. What happened at Rome? Oh, Romans is so good. So I pray that you will join us and stay tuned. All right. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless you. We thank you for the word tonight. We thank you for the teaching. We pray, Father, that it will land according to your will. We thank you for your, your sons and your daughters, God, that will hear this word. We thank you, Father, that their eyes are open, their ears are open, God, and that you give them full revelation according to your will. We thank you, Father, that you perfect those things that concern them, cover them, keep them in Jesus' mighty name. And until next time, we will see you have an awesome balance to your week in Jesus' name.